Greetings, programs. Welcome to the Awesome Friday podcast for Sunday, February the 4th. Can't believe it is February already in 2024. Uh, this week, we are, as usual, recapping two new films, new to us, um, and we hope you enjoy it. My name is Matthew, I'm your host, and with me is my co-host, Simon, who Hello. is older and wiser and... <laughs> That's true. Debatably better looking than me um uh, a, i mean that's very kind i i would say it's a radio way. show you'll have to take that on faith but i'm uh, certainly older um well thank you what a lovely introduction you're uh <laughs> um you have more flex of gray which gives you an air of distinction that i uh, have yet to develop i don't feel particularly wi- particularly wiser even though i am older is because i have no memory and you have all the memory the flow of questions generally is one way <laughs> uh, because I don't, I don't, I don't remember stuff, and also I didn't. Um, you, but that's the difference. Some, so, like, you've got some very niche knowledge that I don't have. But there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom, right? One is knowing things, and one <laughs> is the application of knowing things. So, uh, I can, I'm happy uh, to be the one who knows things, and you can be the one who applies those things. Sure. It's fine. Or I could talk to you um, about grammar anytime you want, but yes, absolutely. Um, That's a different wanna, podcast, but I do enjoy those conversations. We should have a grammar podcast. How awesome would that be? I was very proud of my daughter this week. <laughs> she came home and said, my teacher asked us, does anyone know what an adjective is? And I put my hand up and she chased me. I said, an adjective is a word that describes a noun. She said, some people were t- was talking like adverbs or adjectives, but they describe verbs. I'm like, yes, that's right. My daughter's nine. I'm like, yeah, yeah okay, good. And she said, but then my teacher asked, does anyone know what an adverb is? And I, again, I was the only one who put my hand up, but she didn't see me. <laughs> she kept saying, anyone, does anyone, anyone else, anyone else know what an adverb is? <laughs> Literally anyone else. And both my kids' teachers know that I, what my job is. My job is um, off the back of many, many years of teaching English. I'm now uh, a writing for a test company and basically analyzing language for a test company. So I'm very 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 molecular and pedantic about language which i like i think it's a highlight uh just don't bring it up ever with people that you might love but my kids okay so actually this is interesting because this leads in i do have a question i can ask you that is both film and grammar related Um, (laughs) have you seen the film kiss kiss bang bang oh yes once okay so there's a moment in that film where it's a, it's a, and I don't know the answer. I feel like I feel dumb every time I watch it because I don't one hundred percent know which is correct. But at one point, Robert Downey Jr. says to Michelle Monaghan that he feels bad, and she says badly, because if you say you feel bad, then you're saying that the mechanism that that allows you to feel is broken, and so you need to say badly because it's an adverb. And then later in the film, Val Kilmer corrects him back. Which one of those is correct? Uh, Michelle Monaghan was wrong. I feel bad. Uh, I feel leads up to an adjective describing my state. I am the mm-hmm. non-stated noun. I feel badly talks about the mechanism. And uh, it's like... Maybe I, I, maybe teach, I got it backwards. I teach, I teach badly. Uh, but I just, remember, um, I just remember that like later in the film, there's a really funny moment where like Bell Kimmer gets flustered. And he says, that's an adverb. <laughs> just... <laughs> <laughs> Trust, trust, Val. Yeah. It's no, it's uh, it's an adverb describes the uh, mechanism of the verb, not how you feel. Uh, right. Really, I'm I'm a I'm a wizard parties. I love talking about this shit. It's great. But what's nice is that I um, I've always had a bit of shit from my wife about this um, because I've always corrected the grammar of my kids, even when they're very very young. Um, but that's when just, you have to do it, though. Mm-hmm. Just mildly, just little nudges, rather than I'm not teaching you stuff. It's just like, oh, by the way, this is wrong. This is the correct question. This is why. And as a result now, they have become the annoying pedantic ones in class. And I'm kind of proud about that because, <laughs> uh, because someone's got to carry the torch. But the one mistake, um, you've probably seen me do this, but my teaching style is you're in my classroom. Learning comes from the back of mistakes, the path to success is lined with potholes of failure. And every time you make a mistake, 
you've just got to learn from it. You don't care about your mistakes, because I taught a lot of older students, and they really care about their mistakes. They like, don't care about your mistakes. Embrace your mistakes. None of us is perfect. This is a difficult language. Make lots of mistakes, and I will fix them straight away. So my teaching style is, if you make a mistake, I'm going to interrupt you. I'm going to correct you instantly. I'm going to tell you why it's right, and then we move on. It's not yeah. about intelligence. It's just about information. So when you've done that for enough years, you've got to be really, really careful when you're at home and your wife, if your wife says something <laughs> that's not 100% correct, you must not interrupt her with the correct version instantly. <laughs> now, you know my wife very, very well. So when I tell you the room went silent and cold, I was facing away from her and the room went silent and cold. Uh, my wife is a redhead and uh, deserves the reputation that redhead, redheads have. And uh, I don't do that again. I have learned to control that urge to correct very, very quickly because uh, it didn't go down very well. But I do love it. I don't think that your wife has the reputation deserves the reputation that redheads have because she does have a soul. <laughs> she does, and she can't use touch screens. <laughs> <laughs> she can't. Well, every time now, it happens so often now. Like when we go to check in at aeroplanes or when we go to buy tickets and the touchscreen doesn't re reply to her. She just looks at me and says, you do it. I've got no soul. Like it just <laughs> doesn't, it doesn't respond to her because she is soulless. But hey, yeah, she uses, she's decided to use her powers for good. So that's okay. But um, it's nice. It, it is also a curse. I, it, sorry, parallel to when you were really big on sword fighting and you couldn't watch anything that had sword fighting in it without your brain like tearing it apart it's mm. like that uh, walking down the street and looking in shop windows for me where you realize that what you think is the important things to teach like the grammar and the structure and the the, the actual rules of language um big businesses generally don't really care and they make mistakes all the time and it's in books books make mistakes all the time Companies make mistakes all the time, and I just feel like I should go around with a big red pen and uh, correct things as I see them. But, uh, Maybe, but that's, uh, that's how language you evolves, right? You do have to know the rules in order to break the rules, so maybe there's a lesson in there somewhere. There is. There is definitely. Don't get me started on the education of grammar and language, which has this reputation of being this dry, boring thing, and so nobody bothers to teach it, and where, in fact, it's slightly less dry and boring as one would believe <laughs> although you need a really good teacher for it uh so if you yeah. don't have me sorry sorry about that i want to say this week that i watched uh friday was groundhog day and so yep. uh every year we we of course watched um battle of la no we watched groundhog day uh, with my family and that's a wonderful movie a wonderful movie and i think it might be um uh what's his name oh god bill murray's best performance i think is grand hope mm -hmm. and he's he's got many good performances but I just certainly want to his, talk about certainly his best of the 80s and whether it's or not got... it's his best whether or not it's his best performance i think it's probably his best film incredible range he's got in that film like when he it's it's quite difficult to be that dry and sardonic and funny and then say something serious and not be sarcastic with it anyway yeah. he's great but I just want to talk about Andy McDowell. And initially, I was going to say, you know, whenever this was, when was Groundhog Day made? 93? Uh, isn't it like earlier than that? Uh, no, 93. Hmm. Um, Same year as Jurassic good. Park. Even, it's a good year. for me, that was good. That was a good year. I want to say 1993, Andy McDowell, holy shit. But really, she's just made a TV show for Hallmark where she looks silver hair now, but absolutely incredible. So just holy shit, Andy McDowell. She has got like the eyes, her eyes and her smile. She does that complete open face eye smile thing that is. Yeah, she incredibly... smiles with her whole being. Yeah. But there's one line that as a, I, I've never really picked up before, but she owned me on this one line where she says, I bought you. I own you. I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. oh Andy McDowell. So, yeah. I enjoyed uh, it's a great movie it's a great great movie and i'm very happy to watch it my kids love it as well so we watch it every year this is a uh, a total aside from you know the podcast we're supposed to be recording right now but 1993 yeah. <laughs> 1993 well, jurassic park mrs doubtfire the fugitive schindler's list the firm indecent proposal 
Cliffhanger, Sleepless in Seattle, Philadelphia, and the Pelican Brief. That's just the top ten grocers of the year, not just like holy shit, what a what a year. Cliffhanger. Robin Hood Men in Tights. Yeah. And uh Hocus Pocus, which I saw recently and really enjoyed. I know you don't like it. Uh, uh the piano as well. Piano came out with a bunch of awards. Remains of the day. Uh that's a hell of yeah, a like, year. That's a I mean, every year's a good year for film, but like that's a good year for film. <laughs> yeah. Nightmare before uh, Christmas as well. Yeah, that's a good year. That's a kind of a crazy year, actually. So I wonder what make him like these two. What came out from Canadian film that I might have actually seen? Robocop three is that a good Robocop? No, there's only one good Robocop. Oh really? Okay. Uh, and Butterfly came out. That's Canadian. Uh. Oh, Time Runner. I don't know if you've seen Time Runner, but that's a that's a <laughs> film, all right. It's a time travel film, time travel action film starring Mark Hamill that was Canadian produced. What? Is it, yeah. is it one word, Time Runner? Uh, it's two words. Okay. We're off on a weird tangent here, folks. Sorry about we that. Are... We'll get back on track Ooh. in just a moment. Sorry, we're, we're not touching. Oh, he looks so good at it. Oh, okay. I will watch that film. I mean, I cannot. I haven't seen it since the 90s, uh, but I don't know that I can recommend it. Falling Down came out in 1993. El Mariachi came out in 1993. You could make a podcast just about 1993. Uh, uh, fire, in the, fire in the Sky. Oh, that movie scared the shit out of me. Yeah. Uh, the remake... Of um, the Femme Nikita, Point of No Return came out in 1993. Oh, oh, it wasn't called the Femme Nikita here. Well, the Femme Nikita is a French film. They remade yeah. it in America with Bridget Fonda and called it Point of No Return. Oh, in England it was just called Nikita, I believe. Oh, the Kenneth Branagh Much Ado came out in '93. Hot Shots Part okay. Deux came out in '93. Kenneth Bradley and Much Ado is not a good version of that story. <laughs> it's it's fine. Last action, reason. Last Action Hero came out in ninety three. Like okay, this is, we're getting off track. There's I, we should do a podcast about nineteen ninety three. Okay, I haven't seen Last Action Hero. Like, is that something I should watch with my kids? Is that a yes, friendly age? One hundred percent. It's in fact, your son is exactly the correct age for it at this point. Okay, perfect. Anyway. We should move on. We've been bantering anyway. for 15 minutes. We're way off topic. Sorry about that, folks. Um, we are going to talk sorry. about two movies I'm now, really and good. and we are going to start. We're going to this year, this week. We're catching up with two movies: one from last year and one from this year. Um, we're going to do last year's first. So let's dive into uh, Simon. Why don't you take us through? Because I just I'm itching to hear your description of this film. Why don't you take us through the very basic <laughs> setup of Aquaman? And the Last Kingdom, the Lost Kingdom. Well, the Lost Kingdom. Well, it is the the Last Kingdom for him, that's for sure. Um, yeah. Aquaman two, uh, keep on Aquamaning, uh, joins us with J- Jason Momoa um, playing Aquaman, and now he's king, as we learn in the beginning montage uh, that he uh, did some stuff, and now he's king. And he thought being a king would be cool, but it's actually quite bureaucratic and boring. So he's kind of not really happy with the, uh, the the experience of being the king of Atlantis that isn't, like, running around busting heads. And uh, there's a threat, because there's always a threat. So the threat is um, Black Manta uh, is back. Uh, he fights him, blasts his face off in the first Aquaman, but he, uh, he survives, and he's put together a ragtag team of baddies with some more... He's, like, hunting the world for this mythical Atlantean technology to gets uh, more powerful so he can kill Aquaman, basically. And to do this, he is using this... Uh, he's had a vision. He found a, uh, this trident, which gave him a vision of where to find this fuel source, which can completely... Uh, it was locked away because they discovered it was 
every time you use this fuel source, it's great for these amazing machines, but it completely destroys the planet. So it's basically Aquaman versus someone trying to destroy the environment and him uh, directly. And uh, it goes to various locations, it, it, different biomes as he uh, explore, uh, uh, uses his the help of his brother. He breaks him out and to go after Yah. I can't say his name. How do you say his name? Yaha Abdul Mateen II. I hope that is his full name. Yeah, that's um, basically it. And uh, I think it's basically, technically, I think it's technically closer to Yahya, but um, yeah. I, I just think... want to say as well. I rewatched. Oh, he's great in this film. He's a really good actor. But I, um, he was uh, in the Matrix uh, Resurrections. He was the the reincarnation of Morpheus, where he is a very serious but very smiley kind of dude having a good time and i really enjoyed his performance in that he's he's not that in this film he's very very stoic and very very uh intent on destroying and he's kind of taken over by this ancient like the leader of the lost kingdom and who was so bad they had to put him in ice and so of course they link up and aquaman has to fight with giant fish and all kinds of things um it's complete schlock and i i really really enjoyed it and this is a great uh, example of um, maybe don't put all your faith in reviews because this thing got torn to shreds. I mean, it's it's very, 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 very clear that this movie has been stun edited and ADR'd to an inch of its life uh, to get it out of the can. Like this thing um, went through so many production rewrites and then reshoots and then re-edits. Um, particularly when all the Amber Heard, Johnny Depp stuff happened. And it is, uh, I'm surprised they even managed to finish it because it does feel like it's it's held together by duct tape and, and dreams. And, uh, but it, James Wan's fantastic. And um, as you put it, he sure knows how to point a camera and there's lots of colour in this movie. And it's just, it's, it's a, a, a Saturday schlock matinee. And once you pointed out that it kind of feels like Flash Gordon, that's all I could think about. And it really does feel like schlocky Flash Gordon. Um, yeah. The, en the ending isn't very good. Um, it, it just sort of falls in on itself. And in particular, the last kind of five minutes as they kind of wrap, try to wrap this up through what is very, very clearly uh, years later reshoots against terrible quick green screens. It's really bad. <laughs> the last five minutes is really, really bad. But um, by that point, I'd had such a good time. I don't really care. I really enjoyed this. Yeah, I think that's uh, fair. I think, you know, there was a time when it was acceptable to enjoy schlock, and it feels like that time is currently not now. But this mm. is some pretty solidly enjoyable schlock. It's a perfect, well, it's not perfect, but like, it's the kind of thing that if I had seen it when I was 12, it would, you know, there's a, there's a reason like the last Starfighter is on my Blu-ray shelf, right? Like, and I know, and, and Flash Gordon and movies like that, like they're not good exactly, but they're fun. They're super fun. They're super enjoyable and they are ridiculous. And, and Aquaman is clearly going for that. It does. It has very clearly been hacked to the bone. Uh, in particular, it does feel like they did everything they could to remove Amber Heard from this movie without, but they were, for some reason, were not able to like just fire her and remove her completely. I guess that would have been too expensive. But for someone who is a main character in the first one, she has maybe like a, a dozen minutes of screen time in this one, and all of her line deliveries feel awkward. Not because she's bad, but because they clearly were shot at a different time. And like shoehorned in or like other reshoots are like shoehorned in around her and it does feel awkward and she like the movie like the, the scenes she's in feel like she's part of a different movie a longer movie that she has a more substantive part in basically so like it is awkward but the extended like middle when Aquaman has broken out his brother out of prison his brother who is the villain of the first one Orm played by Patrick Wilson um, there's an extended like buddy comedy adventure bit in the middle that's just a ton of fun. Um, and then uh, the one thing I really appreciated, what made me think compare it to Flash Gordon, as you said, when I that's what I texted to you, 
was that like a lot of the like suits and props are practical, especially Black Manta. I was directly looking at Black Manta when I said it felt like Flash Gordon, because unlike the first one, which tried to like you know drab it up like a Snyderverse movie, this one has like a full on chrome water jetpack that he wears and his mm. eyes are more pronounced and brighter and like the eyes of his mask, the big red glowing eyes that shoot lasers. And um, <clears throat> it just really feels like they were really going for that sort of classic Saturday schlock matinee mm. feeling. And I think it doesn't quite uh, get there in the way that I wish it did. But like, it's, it's there. It's not not there. It's just like, they were clearly hamstrung by all of these reshoots and it feels like I don't know if the the stories of Jason Momoa and Amber Heard not liking each other are true but it definitely feels related to yeah. her lawsuit against Johnny Depp yeah. that she was maybe fired because like they just they outright fired him from Fantastic Beasts uh, and I think maybe they couldn't do that to her here so they've kept her yeah. in like the contractual minimum amount um, there's, and it's a shame because I feel like you could remove her from the film and it wouldn't be that different. Um, no. Yeah. And, and like, I think I honestly, I don't think she's a bad performer. Um, and uh, I've, al I've always liked her. Um, but it's her, her appearances in this film are just so discordant with the rest of the film that it's jarring. And that's a problem. Totally. Um, there's one scene in particular where I don't think they could wriggle out of not having her there. She, she, saves him it's not a spoiler she saves him at one key point with the key skill that she has got and uh i don't think they had a better option for that and she comes like looming into the screen direct <laughs> to the with like the shimmering background with her and it looks like it's her not even like a the, those mobile apps that sort of put your face on other people's bodies and it sort of floats towards you um mm -hmm. emotionless and and then there's one scene there's one scene that's very very clear the moment where they were like we've got to now remove him from the rest of this film but it's very clearly a reshoot uh, between him and her because his hair is completely different and uh, there's no you can almost see there's no chemistry between them whatsoever in that scene and uh, it's quite yeah. obvious whether or not they don't like each other in real life they also clearly like they do not have any any chemistry at least they don't have any sexual chemistry at all. And, which is weird because, like, I seem to recall that part being fine in the first one, but it's really not yeah. here. And yeah. maybe that's an artifact of the reshoots and the, whatever's going on in her real life, or wh whatever it is, it just doesn't work. And it's a yeah. uh, it's a real shame because um, a lot of this movie is really fun. Um, is it high art? No, but is are the parts that are fun fun? Absolutely. And there's more here. There's more fun stuff than than bad stuff here. Um, and we're going to talk about this when we talk about the second film we're talking about this week. But it also, like, James Wan and Jason Momoa are clearly committed to the bit of the version of Aquaman they're trying to create. And it really works because of their buy-in. And I really enjoy that, like... The other thing that strikes me about this is that um, there's a real, th a real opinion that I've had for a long time is that the closer that comic book movies get to comic books, the less the, like, comic book bros online like them uh the, you know they all want dark brooding self-serious quote a mature stuff but like this movie is just trying to be fun and i couldn't appreciate it more for that um and i really really like that like jason momoa seems to be a giant cuddly teddy bear person in real life and that's really bleeding through into this performance of uh, being like very goofy and not afraid to be vulnerable and look silly and, uh, you know, he carries around, like, the whole movie, he just has a pink scrunchie on his arm. And sometimes he puts his hair up in it. And, like, I really enjoy that about it. And I think it's great. Um, and I do think that Jason Momoa is clearly having the time of his life making this movie. And, you know, he doesn't have great chemistry with Amber Heard. But you know who he does have great chemistry with? Who he spends most of the movie with? Patrick Wilson. <laughs> Patrick Wilson. Patrick Wilson is so under... I'm not sure is underrated to the right word, but he should be... Like, he, he's known pretty much as a, a more serious actor, I think. And his uh, his comic delivery in this movie is very, very refined because he understands the part 
that he plays as the straight man. And the straight man is always the one that has to deliver the lines at exactly the right moment with the right face. Because the, the the funny man just gets to be funny, but the straight man makes it land. And his uh, the, the, there's a whole uh, land that time forgot sequence with giant bugs and jungles and stuff. And uh, they are bantering off each other. And Wilson's delivery of his lines are so perfect and so funny. And his looks are so funny. And uh, he's brilliant in this film. Like, yeah. yeah, really wonderful. Yeah, you're not wrong if, you know, you go back to, like, the Abbott and Costellos of the world, and like, mm, they're hilarious, actually, but it's definitely hilarious. it's definitely Abbott that makes them bland, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it's... Yeah. You need the you need the straight man to make the funny, the ridiculous stuff land. And uh, Wilson, Wilson does a great job, because Jason, again, Jason Momoa is just a huge goofball in this movie, and I really, really enjoy that about him. Uh, it even... Like it's not a it's a bit of a spoiler, but like at the very end, he gives a speech not unlike Iron Man at the end of Iron Man One, where he like says, "I am Aquaman," and then he like <laughs> lets out this like elated yell and like drops the mic and like is so goofy and so and I I just I really love that vibe. I, I really wish the film had landed better, um, so we could get more of that vibe. Um, I... And this is and this is before we even talk about how good James Wan is at composing scenes like just like visually composing scenes so so early on there was a cut of this movie that got completely recut because the audience uh focus group feedback was that it was too crazy and too out there and i would love to see that cut of that movie and i would also I would. like to ne- never have focus groups ever again please but uh, i would i'd love to see a james one uh, out there version of this movie because i'm pretty sure it would be better or at least more cohesive than this one I mean, we're talking about the same guy who made *Malignant*, um, <laughs> which is which is a film that like shouldn't work but does, and I feel oh, like right. that's that's the wheelhouse he operates best in stuff that shouldn't work but does. He's and really I think, right. um, I mean, this is a movie that has it's clearly wearing all of its rep- influences on its sleeve. There's a whole scene where they go to like a pirate cove and visit not Jabba the Hutt, who's voiced by Martin <laughs> Short. And I feel like that's probably the closest we're going to get to what you're talking about. Because mm-hmm. um, that whole sequence is kind of great. Uh, you know, there's mm-hmm. shark-headed monsters, and not Jabba the Hutt is a giant fish person. And he's ridiculous and boisterous and fun. And I just, I, I really, I, I really can't overstate how fun, it doesn't all work, but I really can't overstate how fun the fun bits of this movie are. Yeah. Um. But again, like just to, to bring it back, like James Bond is really, really good. You can really tell he's a horror director because a lot of the monster designs and a lot of the way he composes when monsters are attacking are so well put together. And some of them are legitimately scary. Um, mm-hmm. And and very like, but also just like traditionally well executed. Like there's one scene yeah. where um, Black Manta shows up in a house and there's a character in that house who doesn't know that, and he's like walking around the house. And then there's like a lightning bolt, and Black Manta's eyes come on in a black room that the main character mm. in the can't see. And it's not That's like a good. complicated shot, but it's such a well executed version yeah. of that shot. Yeah. Um, I, you know, and, and the movie's I, full of stuff like that. It's, it's he's a brilliant director. I think Furious Seven is the best like post heist when Furious. When Fast and Furious stopped being about racing and had its highest moment and then turned into Paw Patrol Power Rangers, I think Furious 7 is the peak Paw Patrol Power Rangers, like jumping between three skyscrapers. uh, And uh, that whole movie is like the platonic ideal of that crossover where Fast and Furious uh, wanted to be at that time. It's a brilliantly shot film. Yeah. And it's, it's, (laughs) it's full. And then, and then, also, you clearly have, like, the, the other reason that I was sort of talking about Flash Gordon with you when, when I was watching it was that uh, it's got a real retro throwback feel for all of the, like, tech and sets. Like, the the bad guys yeah. exist on this giant hammerhead shark-shaped sub, and everything about the inside feels very, like, almost, it's like, it's not quite Art Deco, but it's very, it's like late-stage mm-hmm. Art Deco look to it. Almost like it was out of Batman the Animated Series. And mm. all of it looks amazing. And all of it looks practical. Like, a lot of it clearly is, like, a big open set with a bunch of stuff in it rather than just, like, mm. a green screen and CGI. 
Um, which, to be fair, again, I think can be pulled off, but like it has a real tangible feel to it. Um, mm -hmm. But more importantly, like the design of it all looks amazing. The design of Black Manta, the redesign of Black Manta's suit looks amazing. The uh, the redesign of Aquaman's suit looks amazing. Um, all of the tech looks amazing. They're like the 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 neon colored Robo Sharks they ride at one point look amazing. <laughs> like I did. Uh, it's got a real zany, wacky feel to it. And you're right. Whatever version was quote too out there, I want to see that version of this movie because I just want to see like the undistilled version of that. Yeah, totally. Uh, we'll never get it, but I wish we did. No, it's a shame. I mean, the it, it got completely shredded, but it's a far more enjoyable watch than The Flash, but significantly better than Wonder Woman two. Um, it's I, I really enjoy Blue Beetle, but it's it's that kind of fun kind of watch. If you like Blue Beetle, you're probably gonna like this movie. Because it doesn't take itself too seriously, and it's very colorful. And I would say that if bit... you like, if you liked Aquaman one, which I think is one of the better, like, for lack of a better way to say it, one of the better DC universe movies to this point. Mm -hmm. Like for me, it was basically the the three good ones would be Aquaman and Wonder Woman one, and mm -hmm. Shazam one. And I think it's really interesting that like Shazam and Wonder Woman both had terrible sequels. Mm. Um, and this one again, like it's it's not great, um, but it feels like it's mostly bad because it was hacked to the bone. Right? Yeah. It feels like it doesn't it doesn't feel like they made a bunch of really bad story choices like they did with Shazam and Wonder Woman two. Um, mm. It fe <laughs> or at least I mean I know it's all subjective, but I did not connect with those films. Um, but this one feels like they either had to deal with Amber, the Hammer Heard situation that they created yeah. for themselves, or they listened to focus groups too much, or yeah, I think so. or or something like that. It feels like an external factor is what sort of boned it over, and yeah, uh, totally. as a result, Same. I think the movie is like it's totally worth. I don't like usually when movies come out on demand and we talk about them. There's I I watch them by you know, renting them or, or whatever. And there's always a moment with Apple, with iTunes, where it's like 25 to rent on premium rental or it's 30 to just buy it. And I always have that moment of like, is this going to be worth it? Mm -hmm. And I did that twice this week because we're talking about two movies that are now available on demand. And one of them I rented and one of them I purchased. And I will say that I, I did that correctly this time. I made the assumptions correctly. So this is totally worth a rental would be the way I would frame it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and like, and like, it's not, it's not going to change anyone's life, but it is a totally fun Saturday afternoon, you know? Yeah. As, as these movies should be, I think that's, yeah. we've lost sight. I think Marvel's lost sight of that completely. These movies should be light and colorful Saturday matinee family adventures. That's all they should. That's all they need to be. I think and, there's a uh, real thing in the universe right now where, we need to remember that like comic books are for kids and it's okay. And stuff for kids can have broad appeal for adults as well. Um, but I feel like we've really forgotten that. Uh, there's a whole other conversation about everything that's come, all the news is coming out about the last airbender live action remake mm. that exemplifies this. I'm not going to go into yeah. it, but just Google it because like, it really yeah, feels like... like they are missing the point of that series. Oh my God. And I, I, could, and I yeah. feel like, and I feel like that, you know, I think it's okay to, on the one hand, I think it's okay to target a superhero movie towards adults, but I feel like it's a mistake to only do that. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, this is a good example of a film that's clearly, it's got some dark bits. And it's got some scary monsters, but like it is a movie that like kids and adults alike could enjoy. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I thought it was. I thought it was good. I thought I had a good time watching it. I don't I know if it's time. good, but I had a good time watching it. So <laughs> I enjoyed the hell out of it. I am uh, going to give this one perfect. Uh, it's a perfect three star. It's an imperfect three star Saturday afternoon <laughs> matinee. Totally rent it when you get a chance. Uh, it's fine. It's totally fine. I. I will say, if the Rio decides to do a double bill with Aquaman one and two, I will be there. Like just like I watched the two Godzillas uh, this week, I will mm -hmm. go and watch this movie on the big screen because it is exactly the kind of movie that you should go to a, a very old schlocky cinema and watch a schlocky movie with popcorn. It's 
it's perfect for that. Three stars for me as well. Yeah, it's it's. I I can't I can't. This is the kind of movie that like eventually it's going to be on Netflix, and I'm going to be like, yeah, I'll watch that again. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I hundred percent watch it again. Yeah. So, um, okay. well, so that's Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. It's available on demand. Uh, and this is your reminder that if you go into the show notes for this episode and find the homepage link for this episode, there will be just watch powered links you can use to find where you can watch it. And if you use those links, you will help us keep the lights on around here. So uh, please do that. <laughs> um, but let's move on. We're going to talk about a new 2024 film. Uh, we're going to talk about Jason Statham in The Beekeeper. Uh, this film came out uh, a couple weeks ago in cinemas and it is now available on premium on demand. And we have now both seen it. And... Uh, <laughs> yes, what happens in the beekeeper? Good luck, with, good luck with your summary. What have I done to myself here? So Jason Statham, in this film, Jason Statham plays a humble beekeeper who is renting land from a woman played by Felicia Rashad. And he rents uh, a little bit of land and part of the barn so he can keep his bees and live a peaceful life. And then one day, she is taken in by a uh, fishing scam. And they empty out all of her bank accounts and also a multi-million dollar account that she manages for a charity. And as a result, she takes her own life out of, you know, shame uh, and, you know, just shame is what it is. And he discovers this. She's the only person who's ever been nice to him. And he starts the movie. The movie gets going in earnest by... Him going, figuring out where the cybersecurity, uh, cyber phishing scam people are located and burning down the building after beating up all the security guards. At the same time, uh, Felicia Rashad's daughter, who is played by um, Emmy Raver Lampen, who you may know from the Umbrella, uh, Umbrella Academy, among other things. Uh, is an FBI agent, and she ends up on the case of this like burned down house, and realizes that Jason Statham is the man who has done it. Uh, <clears throat> and then it comes out that not only does Jason Statham keep bees uh, and make honey, <laughs> but also that he is a beekeeper, which is a secret, <laughs> extra governmental uh, secret agency that maintains the hive that maintains order for society and to be clear not american society but society at whole yeah. uh and uh when something goes wrong they move to correct it and he's a retired beekeeper so he's doing it for personal reasons um but that's fine because he goes basically on a rampage leading him ever more towards the people at the top of this at the center of this hive of hornets that are exploiting people he's going to go and kill them all and I almost don't want to say anything else. This this movie goes places. This movie goes places. The the CEO of the company that ultimately owns this the fishing call center is played by Josh Hutcherson, and he is a perfect like mid like late twenties, early thirties cyber bro douchebag. Um. And Jason Statham has approximately a dozen lines, many of which are to Josh Hutcherson, which are all perfect. Um, his accent in this film is ostensibly American, but it is so bad that they took a moment to write lines of into the script to be like, oh, you sound like you might be actually British. <laughs> and, I, was and born there. To, I was born there, but I've been here. For, you know, it's just it's so ridiculous. And then you also have Jeremy Irons around as the uncle slash security chief of the, you know, uh, business conglomeration to, to be the guy to deliver absolute bullshit with the gravitas <laughs> that only a Royal Shakespeare Society trained actor can do. Um, and I don't like this is the kind of movie that like and this is not a spoiler because it's in the trailer, but this is the kind of movie where. At one point, a henchman is on a bridge, and Jason Statham catches up with him and attaches a tether to the henchman's chest, and then takes the other end of the tether and ties it to his truck, and then puts a brick on the accelerator of a truck and sends it off the bridge. And it is friggin' glorious. 
Like this is the level of like kills and ridiculousness that this movie has. And then when he right after that he has a conversation with Judge Hutcherson and he says, "You sound young. I bet you haven't invested in estate planning." And Judge Hutcherson says, <laughs> "says I'm 28 years old. Why the hell would I need that?" And Jason Statham says, "I'm about to show you." <laughs> and it cuts to black. Like I need you to understand what kind of movie you're getting into here. Um, but it is. As I said with Aquaman, it is so committed to the bit. It is so aware of itself and committed to itself that even when there's some crazy logical inconsistencies, it doesn't matter because it is so much fun. Um, and Jason Statham, it's, you know, there's movies with Jason Statham in them and then there's Jason Statham movies. And this is maybe the best <laughs> one of the latter kind that I've seen in ages. Um, I had a great time watching this movie. Um it is uh it's another like perfect like thursday night throw on for me and uh i can't wait to watch it again i don't know how did you feel about it <laughs> when i tell you that i love this movie <laughs> like <laughs> it's interesting about this film is that the first quarter is really derivative it's it, it takes it's basically a john wick reskin in so many ways uh so with jason staten's and what's nice about Jason Statham is that he's in a film with Jeremy Irons. And Jeremy Irons, who is also English, obviously felt um, pity for Jason Statham. So um, he he made his American accent even worse just to compensate for Jason Statham's. Um, but the first quarter of this movie, I remember thinking, this is just, this is not good. Like, this is so derivative. And then there's the bit where he, the, the guy goes off the bridge. And then there's this... He, um, uh, someone tries to kill Jason Statham and uh, she's dressed like um, uh, 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 someone out of a cyberpunk movie from the early 90s, just out of nowhere. This is set modern day, by the way. And uh, from that point on... Don't, don't forget movie, that that scene takes place at a gas station, which later explodes. because well, Of course, of just as he's driving away from it. From that point, the whole movie is a series of... Wait, what? <laughs> 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 Sorry, sorry, they're doing they're doing what? And it just builds and builds and builds and it's incredible. From that point on, uh it was just the so much fun to uh to realize that David Ayer, Ayer the director who yeah. has been much maligned by studio interference, I think finally got to make a film when no one told him what to do. And basically is like, you know what? I'm going to show this is a movie being funded by MGM. I'm going to show them how to reboot Bond, uh, but uh, <laughs> Roger, Roger Moore Bond. Like let's let's go back to the more ridiculous era. But how how would we do that in one day? This is what I would do. And there's I I don't there's so many lines I want to say quote verbatim, but are kind of mini spoilers of wait what moments. And yeah, I'm just one hundred percent. And this is the the perfect script has the perfect actor to deliver the lines. And at one point, a South African baddie who's trying to kill Jason Statham, that doesn't narrow things down, says, you're just a man. And Jason Statham, in the most perfect delivery of pathos, says, I know. <laughs> and then they carry on fighting. <laughs> and it is, it is just brilliant. And he is... His accent is awful. so bad they had to write it into the script. But honestly, the the thing that makes this movie is the pairing of Emmy Rava Lampman and Bobby Nadiri, who I've never seen before, as the two um, FBI agents trying to track him down. She's the daughter of the the woman that uh, that shot herself at the beginning, so there's family stakes there as well. And they're brilliantly written, and they bounce off each other fantastically, and. Uh, I I really like when a script is funny without trying to be a comedy. Does that make sense? Yep. And, yeah, and uh, makes sense. And it builds and it builds and it builds to. Um, it, it's it's hard to talk about the last thirty minutes of this film because there's one point. You definitely. That, so you definitely. Let's just. I'm going to cut you off there because there yeah. is nothing you should say about the whole last no. half of this movie. No, no, no. Like, there's, there's, there's definitely a point where you're like, there, there's no way they're going to do what they've just done, and the and the film's like, you know what? I'm I'm not only going to do it. I'm going to do it more than you think I'm going to do it, and it's just yeah. brilliant. Oh my god! It's like the cinema. The last half of this movie is like the cinematic 
equivalent of that one scene in this is spinal tap when when uh i can't remember which one i think it's christopher <laughs> guest says yeah this one goes to 11 you know um and i'm gonna disagree i'm gonna disagree with you very slightly in that for me the film gets going earlier than it got going for you there's a okay. there's a scene where we still don't know exactly who or what jason statham is and the thugs who like own the call center that he's just burned down go to his house and he destroys them utterly. And uh, that whole sequence is where the movie really got going for me. Uh, Cause it's intercut with a scene where security chief Jeremy Irons phones his, uh, his replacement as director of the CIA mini driver and says, we seem to have stumbled on a beekeeper. And she says, wait, you mean like, a beekeeper beekeeper <laughs> <Just>. <laughs> and like it's it's like an early scene and it, it just becomes sort of like emblematic of of like what the rest of the film is going to be in terms like exactly what you said before a, a lot of like wait what moments and uh and uh it's and that and that whole action scene in which he like takes them out one by one as they're going around his house and the way he dispatches the world's most annoying henchman ever um like the most annoying henchman and maybe the recent history of all cinema is uh is great. And uh I, I had a I had a ball watching this movie. It's another like perfect like Saturday afternoon, like Thursday night. I cannot I purchased this one. I made the gamble to purchase this one and I chose correctly. Oh, I cannot wait did, to watch yeah. I, I cannot wait to watch it again. Oh man. It's so great. And I'm I'm really struggling to to there's no way I can clarify how much I enjoyed this film without spoiling little bits of it. And it's best, it's best to watch this film really without any knowledge of it, because the little, the little surprises that keep coming are just um, so full of serotonin. It's really great. But and I will say as well, something that these films that I, I uh, really ruin a film like this for me is if the fight choreography and editing is bad, see echo. Um, the fight choreography in this is brilliant and the shots are brilliant and also uh, really good editing and interesting sound decisions there's one fight in a corridor with mirrors and they they cut all the dramatic music so you just hear the punctuation uh, is the mirrors being scraped and being smashed and it is mm-hmm. so effective it's so good and um there's there's some very long fight sequences that are very intelligently edited with good passive cameras. None of this, like, all identity three millimeters away and cutting all the time. And uh, the stunt works really, really good. And Staten can sell a punch like nobody else. Like, he is, never mind his accent, he's brilliant. I was going to say, it does help that he's, like, a very, very good martial artist and a very, very good stage combatant. Um, Because you're right, a lot of the a lot of the fight scenes in particular are really, really well executed. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's really good at being like that, like that mirror room fight that you're talking about is a great example of like, you know, he's the hero of the story. He's the protagonist of the story. You know, he's not going to lose the fight, but mm-hmm. he manages to, to make that whole fight seem dangerous. Like the other guy yeah, is he- clearly, is clearly his equal. Uh, and uh, he's really good at selling that aspect of it. And it's really intelligent the way that that fight plays out for the rest of the movie without it's the, spoiling yeah. exactly what happens. Like, it's really, it's yeah. a really well executed, not just fight, but like moment in the plot of the movie as well. And a lot of the fight scenes do like that. He's, uh, he, he's got that John McClane magic where he gets genuinely hurt and he looks like he's hurt, but he just keeps going. And he's a, he, he is, uh, I don't know. It's never really established if the other beekeepers are as trained as he is, or if he is a beekeeper outlier, because it w- you, you would have thought there should be a whole army of people equivalent to him to take him down. But um, apparently not. Apparently he's a singular talent among uh, everyone. But um, <laughs> but I, also I, I, like I, I, <laughs> no, I we can't say, talk about that moment. I, <laughs> there's there's another thing, and this comes from earlier in the film, but like. One thing I will say about this film that does make it ridiculous, and again, it's so committed to the bit anyway that it doesn't actually matter, but like, in one scene, Jeremy Irons is like, when I was sworn in as CIA, I was written into programs even <laughs> I couldn't conceive of, and like, nobody knows about the beekeepers, 
And then, like, in the very next scene he's in, he's like, here's a bunch of details about the beekeepers. And everyone's like, oh, yeah, like, the beekeepers, I know about them. Like, let's call, let's talk to the current beekeeper. And, like, oh, no, and, like, and then it's, like, the beekeepers, super secretive, operate in the shadows. And then we meet the current beekeeper, and they are, like, dressed in ultra purple and have a minigun in their truck and blow, like, it's so just, like, what they're saying is happen happens and what actually happens are very discordant things. And it like uh, as it's much like as it's it, committed, it's it, what it's the bit it's committed to is making Jason Statham look amazing, not uh, to it, internal plot consistency, is what I'm trying to get at. Um, I just so, loved yeah. about it's a minor spoiler, but I absolutely loved the part where it went John Wick, where they hired the assassins to kill the rogue assassin. They hired all the other beekeepers to kill the beekeeper, and then the cyberpunk girl turns up, and he dispatches her. And then the beacon next scene is when he drivers like uh, the beekeepers aren't going to do it. They've decided to remain neutral. It's like we're not going to see any more beekeepers. <laughs> like <laughs> oh, okay, okay, all okay, right. And, uh, and so it, you have to have all these different work groups. It's just uh, it's great. There's no yeah. fucks given in this film, and it is it's really well made. It's really well yeah. shot. It's extremely satisfying. Uh, I will say that my my initial and main reaction to this movie when when the credits rolled was well. I can't wait to see the next one uh, in yeah. January 2026. Like, <laughs> you know, like this is exactly the kind of movie that's it's uh, it's I a. Hope so. My favorite piece of writing about this movie is from David Ehrlich, and he, he in the early paragraphs of his review said that like if he was put into a ten year coma and he woke up and you showed him this movie, he would not be able to tell you what year it was, but he would know for certain that it was mid January, and that is the perfect description of this movie. And I cannot wait for the second one to come out in two January's time. You know, it's yes. uh, and and the third one yes. perhaps three years after that. Next like year. Just, just keep pumping them out it's like a yearly event. Uh, yeah. and, I, and and the, the best thing is this movie uh, begins with like he's a beekeeper, he protects the hive, and then everything, every target he goes up, it's like and the beekeeper has to uh, do this metaphor and like go to the next field, and then the beekeeper has to think about the children that the bees in the hive and by the end of this film there are so many integrated bee metaphors they go so far with their bee metaphors and so any future film is going to have to go even further with their bee metaphors well you're um, not even we're not even talking about the fact that like so emmy yeah, raver lentham like at one point finds yes. a book finds a book about beekeeping not about being a secret <laughs> agent but about keeping bees and then for the rest of the movie, just keeps like reading things about beekeeping out as metaphors for what Jason's like. It is ridiculous. I love her uh, in this film, and she's yeah, she's so much fun. And I'm gonna say um, that like you haven't seen Bobby Nadiri and anything else, and he hasn't no, done yeah. a ton of movies, but you should definitely seek out 2016's Under the Shadow, which is an amazing Iranian horror film uh, oh. in which a young woman is ter is terrorized by by a jinn. Um, he plays. Uh, he's great in it, and it's a great film. Oh shit! Okay, I will get on that. Uh, it's uh, worth mentioning as well that uh, Josh Hutchinson is doing very, very well here in his post um, uh, post Hunger Games career. Uh, we, we in our bonus episode this week, we talked about actors playing against type, and he is he is one hundred percent crypto douche bro uh, up to his eyeballs, and he fully commits to that, and he is rather fantastic in this. And um, yeah, he really is actually. He's really, uh, he's turned out to also be one of those, you know, he could just live off the Hunger Games forever, and I feel like he's making interesting choices between, like, this and Five Nights at Freddy's and uh, his TV show, uh, Future Guy, I think it was called. Um, yeah. He's made some really interesting choices, and he's really branching out in a way that I appreciate. Yep. So, um, if, if the Hive is uh, a five-star system... And the bees have to live in any part of those five sectored elements of the hive. And your bees were how you feel about this film. And your queen is in one of the hive parts. How many parts of the hive would be filled with your bees uh, out of five? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but I'm giving this movie, a, it's a perfect three star movie. Oh. Uh... Uh, I disagree with you. This is a perfect four star movie for me, and I I just love how it's um, it, it just ticks my box of really well done, great fight choreography. Jason Statham is a, is a box in itself, but just um, uh, doesn't doesn't stop like upping the ante 
until the end. And mm-hmm. uh, I feel like a lot of parallel films, I mentioned this, with the, the latest John Wick, uh, the John Wicks tend to build to an amazing fight. And then in its final fight is very philosophical and like end of Kill Bill where they talk about death and then someone dies. This this movie doesn't care about that. This movie goes up, 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 up. <laughs> and uh, I enjoy it much more when it's like that. So this is a, this is a four star for me. I can't wait to see it again. Yeah, that's totally fair. For me, it's a it's a perfect three star, um, fueled all, again almost entirely by its just commitment to its own ridiculousness, and uh, and I, I legitimately uh, cannot wait to see it again, like and to see I, to see more of it. Like I, uh, I would say like in terms of like Jason Statham movies, this is not it's not as good as the Meg but it's way better than the Meg too. So do, <laughs> on that spectrum, do what you will. And uh, for me, it's a three star. <laughs> I can't wait for the shout factory still book like of this dub four, four K behind the scenes. Uh, I'll be there. I'll be all over it. I mean, yeah, I hope that uh, I hope they do do a good release, but I, I, you know, I have little faith in that at this point. <laughs> um <laughs> Anyway, uh, so Thanks. yeah, that's the beekeeper. Uh, we both mm-hmm. think you should definitely see it, and we both think that Aquaman two is worth your time yeah. if you want to have a good time on a random Thursday night. Uh, perfectly, uh, perfectly cromulent choices. Those two movies are a great double bill in that order. If you've got a couple of hours to kill, you could do much worse than doing Aquaman two, the beekeeper one after the other. Yeah, good. Uh, well, I think we're going to wrap it up there. Um, thank you so much for listening to the show. We do appreciate each and every one of you who do so. If you've liked what you've heard, there's a couple of ways you can support us. Uh, first and perhaps most impactfully is uh, give us a review on your podcasting platform of choice. The more five-star reviews we have, the more earballs we'll end up in front of. Uh, and hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. Um and you'll get to hear us every week. We also do have a Patreon. We've already mentioned our bonus show, but all Patreon supporters get access to our weekly bonus shows. This year, we this year this week we talked about uh, again like actors playing against type and our favorite versions, uh, favorite of those kinds of performances. Uh, and I think it was a fun conversation. And support costs as little as two dollars Canadian per month, which is uh, it's you know. I bought a latte this morning and it was seven dollars. So Jeez. I'm just just saying, it was seven dollars or was it six dollars? It was a lot of money. I bought two lattes. It's that was almost thirteen dollars. And uh, so do you know? It's two bucks. It's two bucks. It's not that much. And uh, we would love to have you. <clears throat> um, also, if you want to watch these films, uh, I said before, if you go to the show notes of this episode and and go to the homepage at awesomefriday.ca for this episode, you will find just watch powered streaming links which will take you to the places you can watch this film these films and if you do that um we do get a small referral fee so uh please feel free to do that because it'll help us keep the lights on as well keep the show going uh last but not least we are recording here in vancouver on the unceded and ancestral territories of the musqueam tsleil and squamish nations and uh last but definitely not least again thank you so much for listening and for joining us on this awesome Friday. Bye.